they are being told that they are buying one thing when in fact they are provided with something else entirely. Now this comes up in a couple of ways. It comes up just in basic advertising, where in this country, unlike some other countries, ISPs will often advertise the maximum speeds that, that you can get out of the service as opposed to the minimum speeds. And so many consumers are told they can get up to a certain speed and the up to often in rather fine print. And yet the reality is for many of those customers, they don't get anything close to that. There are other countries that have said that we ought to take that, the opposite approach, that a telco ought to stand by or an ISP ought to stand by a minimum speed at which they can virtually guarantee a consumer is going to get. Uh, and that's, what you, that's the basis upon which you advertise. I think we could do that. And I think we could do more. I think we must do more about disclosing the kind of network management practices that ISPs engage in. And of course, the, the paradigm example for this has been the shaping that's occurred from companies like Rogers and Bell. Bell most recently, of course, in the case before the CRTC, where they readily acknowledge, at least now, as part of regulatory hearings, that they, during parts of the day, a sizable part of the day, but frankly, for certain applications, will shake down or throttle the speeds down to, I believe it's about 80% 80 80 down from what it the maximum speeds or the typical speeds that they could otherwise provide. Now that's the sort of thing that surely ought to be fully disclosed. And when Bell initially started moving in this direction, they had virtually nothing on their website that even disclosed any of these kinds of practices. The same is true for Rogers, which for years was engaged in various kinds of throttling and shaping practices, and you could never get a straight answer as to whether or not they were doing it or not. Now, it seems to me that whether or not you agree with the practices or not, it ought to be at a minimum a requirement that the disclosures ought to be fair and frank and fully accessible to consumers so that they know precisely what they're buying and can make as informed a choice as possible. Now, of course, I've recognized there are those who will argue that there is no real choice today in the Canadian market. You can choose throttler A or throttler B, but at a minimum, you ought to at least be, made, be aware of what it exactly it is that you're buying. And at, at this point in time, that's simply not the case. The third area that I think we ought to be able to agree on and ought to be able to act on is the issue of undue preferences. And the CRTC has moved us in that direction with the new media here. The concern around undue preference is where you get a provider who will provide a preference, say, for some of their own content at the expense or applications at the expense of someone else's. This came up directly in the new media hearings where notwithstanding the CRTC's desire to avoid discussion of net neutrality hearings. There were repeated attempts to raise the issue before the Commission, and in fact, Palmorex, which run, runs the weather network, talked about specific incidents that they've encountered where some of the services that they want to provide, they believe are subject to undue preference, where the, uh, where the, care, the wireless carrier prefers their own content or other contracted content over their content, making it very difficult for, for that company to do business, to use advertising models, to do a range of different things. And it's clear that the CRTC list and this, that the CRTC was sensitive to those kinds of concerns because that's one of the recommendation that comes out of last week's new media hearing. So notwithstanding the headlines about the CRTC taking a hands-off approach to the internet um, or new media, which I think generally was a good decision, on that particular issue, on the undue preference issue, they said we have to ensure that it applies to new media as well. And I think we have to ensure that indeed that kind of, that basic principle applies as broadly as possible in the online environment, whether wired or wireless. The fourth issue that I'll, that I'll point to, and then I think I'll sit down, is around privacy and deep packet inspection. And here's one where you begin to bring in the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, as opposed to necessarily some of the traditional regulators. We know that part of the way in which ISPs engage in some of these practices is to examine the packets themselves. I mean, there's just no way to identify what you're dealing with unless you're examining the packets. They have argued or tried to argue that, at least for the moment, they only examine very basic header type information. They don't go into the content itself. But even at the CRTC, new media hearings acknowledge that the technology was there to allow them to go further if desired. The Privacy Commissioner of Canada has really started to focus on this issue of DPI. I think we have to ensure both that that office in Canadian privacy law ensures that telcos aren't able to engage in a kind of examination of what people are doing online, I think, in basic violation of our privacy. So what can we do? I think this doesn't solve the net neutrality issue or the big issue, some of the big issues that were noted at the very beginning. But I think it, go, it moves us some way towards addressing some of the concerns that are out there. And from my perspective, there are things that we can do today. Thanks very much.
for those very specific suggestions, uh, things that we will uh, pick, pick up again uh, during the discussion uh, for specific low-hanging fruit that we want to keep track of, no content blocking, transparency, undue preferences, and privacy and deep packet inspection. So keep all those um, on top of the table, and uh, we'll hear from Charlie Amy. Thank you. I'm going to uh, tonight uh, speak. I'll take Michael started with some specifics. I'm going to go to very generalities because uh, I have a confession to make. I'm not a techie. I hate plugging things in. I just want to turn it on and make it work. And I think many people are like that. Um, as well, I don't know if Tim Hudak is in the room, but his leadership van was outside. So I want to say, Tim, it's okay. I think it'd be great if the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party got in on the issue of net neutrality and if Tim is in the room and wants to come and join the discussion, uh, I don't know if Randy Hillier's here, maybe they left, okay. But it would have been great. Um, I want to say uh, at the outset, uh, you know, I was, my 10 year old daughter does not believe there never was, she doesn't believe there wasn't an internet. It, she looks at me and, and laughs, it, it's, this is absurd dad. And I, I want to make a public admission here. I got it wrong. Uh, in 1984, I had this tech geek. I don't know. No offense to tech geeks, but he kept coming and bothering me. He said, you write things and you guys publish things. I could put them on billboards or bulletin boards. And I said, what would people do with these bulletin boards? And he said, well, they'd read them. And I'd say, well, who would be reading them? Don't people have a life? That they sit there with a the, the telephone cord? And I mean, I was into desktop publishing. I had my little Mac, and it, it, something that you read was on paper. And he kept saying, these bulletin boards are going to be big. And uh, I, I, one time I saw him at the grocery store, and I hid in the other aisle so I could avoid him, because I just was thinking, this guy is too strange. Fast forward a few years, and I'm, I'm only telling you this because I think it frames how we come to understand the importance of, and I call it the digital commons. Fast forward a few years, and I was involved with a very uh, rural-based community group fighting a massive uh, garbage plan that had the backing of the Ontario government, the biggest waste management company in the world. And we were uh, a rural, considered a backwater in northern Ontario. And when you're in these situations, what they do is they baffle you with high-priced consultant bullshit, and you know they're lying to you. You know it's BS, but they've got technical data and you don't. And you have no way of getting technical data. And a friend said to me, you should really try this thing called the internet. And I said, yeah, whatever, I sit there, that's kind of bulletin boards. He said, type in anything. <laughs> so I typed in one of the technical questions we had about this crazy scheme they were selling us, and we got technical reports from the University of Virginia. We got technical reports from California. And suddenly, a very ragtag group of native people and loggers and farmers were on the same level as the consultants. And we went on to win that battle, the Adams Mine Garbage Dump. And we went on to win one of the biggest toxic waste wars afterwards.